In the last lecture, we talked about general chemistry. In this lecture, we're going to talk about organic chemistry, or um, chemistry of all of the big molecules that make up our cells and living things, such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. An organic molecule is just a molecule that has carbon in it. And if you remember from general chemistry, carbon has four valence electrons. So that means he can make four bonds in order to fill his valence shell. So he is super versatile in that um, he can have four different uh, you know, compounds or different atoms attached to him at the same time. So it, carbon has a great ability to form large, complex, and very diverse molecules that are necessary for life. In fact, we can see on the right here that we've got, you know, and this is just a handful of different kinds of organic molecules that carbon can make. You know, straight chains um, up here where they're just straight across. We can have branch chains. We can have um, uh, rings of carbon. So it's very, very versatile element. Now, the simplest organic molecule is what we call a hydrocarbon, and we can get from the name that it's going to contain only hydrogens and carbon atoms. So it's you know the simplest type of organic molecule. In fact, it's important as fuel. Um, the your gasoline that you put in your car is made of hydrocarbons. Uh, if you you know take a look at the octane rating or whatever, oct means eight, so it's you know a fuel based on um, eight carbons in a chain. Anyways, that's a little side note. As these hydrocarbons get more and more complex, they're going to have unique 3D shapes that are important uh, for function. And we can also have um, different functional groups, okay, or different other atoms attached to hydrocarbons that are going to also have important functions. So if we see here in the examples, we've got um, if it's called an OH. Okay, it's called a hydroxyl group. It's found in alcohols and sugars. Um, a carbon that's double bonded to oxygens, okay, is what we call our carbonyl group. Okay, also popular, popularly found in sugars. Um, we can have nitrogen groups or amine groups, um, which is most likely found in proteins. And last but not least, in you know these examples, we you have that COOH group. If you probably remember from uh, chemistry, uh, the carboxyl group or carboxylic acid group uh, that is found in, again, proteins and um, fatty acids as well. So you can imagine that we can start with the simplest hydrocarbon um, organic molecule, and if we add uh, different atoms to it, or um, if we bond it differently with you know, double bonds or triple bonds, we can get a plethora of different kinds of organic molecules um, that can make up our cells and fuel our cells and be responsible for the chemical reactions that sustain life. So far we've talked about, you know, simplest organic molecules, the hydrocarbon, and how we can add different atoms to it and rearrange the bonds to make different functional groups. So that's kind of on the smaller scale. What we can do is we can put a bunch of those um, monomers or we, what you know different kinds of um, organic small molecules together, and we can make very, very, very large what we call macromolecules. Macro meaning huge. So these are very, very large molecules. In fact, most of the proteins, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates or carbohydrate chains that we you know consume in our food that our body digests and incorporates into our cells are macromolecules. They are what we call polymers. Okay, So their structure is huge, but it is not very complicated to figure out because um, a polymer is basically a big chain of um, the same like repeating pattern of smaller molecules in it. And those smaller molecules are what we call monomers. So the monomers are, you know, the little organic molecules, and when we hook up those little organic molecules, um, one right after in a big chain, that's what we call a polymer.
So if we take a look at the pictures on the right, this is kind of just a crude example. Um, you know, here we have a monomer. So this is you know one of the smaller hydrocarbon um, uh, molecules that we can have, and if we hook them all together, you see here um, we get a big long chain or a polymer that makes up a macromolecule. Now, the way that our cells link smaller monomers together to make long polymer chains is fairly simple and consistent. It's called dehydration synthesis. And what happens is that um, when monomers come together, a water molecule is removed, okay, and we get um, a sticking together of monomers to form a polymer or a long chain. So, you know, one after another, we take out a, a water molecule and that monomer sticks to the chain. And we take off another water molecule, that monomer sticks to the, the chain. So it keeps growing N by N just like that. And this occurs for all of the different types of uh, macromolecules that we discussed um, earlier. So the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the nucleic acids um, all work in this similar manner where it's called dehydration. So you you think about dehydration means you know, you're running out of water. Well, you're taking out water in this chemical reaction in order to put monomers together as a polymer chain. Now you can imagine if we take out water from the monomers, that's going to bring the polymer together. Well, what if we want to uh, break up the polymer? What if we want to break the chain? What we do is we add uh, water to it. Okay, and so that's called a hydrolysis. Um, so most of the time when um, we have a chain of very long monomers, um, in order to break it, we just add water okay, to the chemical reaction, and it's going to break that polymer into two or more chains. Um, or if we keep adding water, we can break them into the individual monomers as well. This slide goes into a little bit more detail about hydrolysis that I was just talking about. So remember, um, hydrolysis is used to break down macromolecules. So if we have a long polymer chain, if we want to break it into smaller chains or individual monomers, all we do is we add water. And in fact, this is what your body does during digestion. Food is made up of huge macromolecules, long chains of polymers, and for our cells, in order for our cells to absorb them and use them, our body needs to break them down into either monomers or very small um, chains of polymers in order for the, the uh, digestive cells to absorb and use them. So we've got to, you know, that's why one of the reasons why we need water is for this hydrolysis reaction. So a water molecule needs to be added for, you know, every chemical reaction to break apart that monomer or polymer, I should say, into monomers or smaller chains. All right, so we've taken a look at the building blocks of these macromolecules. You know, the hydrocarbons, the different functional groups that can be added, and how we get, um, you know, big, long chains of macromolecules. So what we're going to do now is we're going to focus on the four main types of biological macromolecules. So we're going to take a look in detail at carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. The first macromolecule we're going to focus on is carbohydrates. And carbohydrates are uh, made up of very simple sugars called monosaccharides. And those are the building blocks of bigger and bigger carbohydrates. So the simplest carbohydrate is what we call a monosaccharide. And basically, monosaccharides are made up of, um, you know, multiples of the, you know, the base formula CH2O. So we can have repeating patterns of CH2O, you know, down a chain, and we get carbohydrates. Now, the simplest monosaccharides are going to be six carbons long. And um, if you take a look they're going to have, you know, kind of a different arrangement each. So on the right here, we've got a monosaccharide called glucose and also a monosaccharide called fructose. And we can see that they're all made up of uh, six carbons, 
12 hydrogens and 6 oxygens. But remember from chemistry that we can have what's called an isomer. Remember we have molecules with the same molecular formula. So both of these are C6H12O6. So they have the same atomic building blocks. But look at the structure. It's completely, it's not completely, but it's very different. Um, here we've got our carbonyl group at the end of the molecule for glucose, but fructose, it's you know one carbon um, kind of down. It's on the second carbon instead of the first carbon. And um, we can see a different pattern of you know the OH groups, the hydroxyl groups, okay, as well arranged in these two different monosaccharides. So um, the sh this shape, the different shapes and the different monomers that exist actually are very important and they're going to have different properties and our bodies are going to use them differently um, in digestion and for fuel and stuff. So for example, our body does not use fructose uh, monosaccharide for energy. It only uses glucose monosaccharide. So the placement of the, you know, this carbonyl group is hugely important um, for our cells to recognize it as energy. In the previous slide, I showed you kind of the skeleton way to um, represent a monosaccharide in a very linear form, you know, top to bottom, um, with the uh, hydroxyl groups and the carbonyl groups kind of very easily laid out so that we can see them. But um, kind of in reality, the monosaccharides are not really chains. They're actually rings. Okay, so like we see here. So this is a um, very simple chain drawing okay on the left but in reality okay um, monosaccharides look more like this where they kind of bend around and they form this hexagonal ring so this example is of glucose which again you know is the the cells fuel it's the sugar that the cells use for for work and um, so in reality when uh, it's being broken down in your digestive system and being absorbed, it's actually in ring form rather than in you know the, the skeleton kind of linear form. So let's start getting a little more complicated with our carbohydrates. So we talked about monosaccharides as being the building blocks, the monomers, uh, the very simplest forms of carbohydrates. And when we bring two monosaccharides together, we form what's called a disaccharide because the prefix di means two. So two monomers or monosaccharides joined, again, remember, by the, the dehydration synthesis. That's how we get um, you know, smaller units of, macro, of molecules together to form macromolecules. So if we um, join two glucose sugars together, two glucose monosaccharides, we make a bigger sugar called a disaccharide. And this particular... Um, Disaccharide is called maltose. So if you've ever uh, looked at the ingredients on, you know, something that you've eaten and it lists maltose, that basically means it's two glucose monosaccharides put together to form a bigger sugar. Um, sucrose is also a disaccharide. That's probably one that you've uh, you can recognize. Sucrose is a f a glucose monomer hooked up with a fructose. Monomer. So that's glucose and fructose together make sucrose. Now, um, lots and lots and lots of different um, sweets, especially uh, processed foods, contain high fructose corn syrup, which is basically a bunch of fructose monomers together. And, um, you know, they are used to sweeten things because fructose is twice as sweet. Okay, the high fructose is twice as sweet as you know, regular um, sucrose. So the uh, food companies really want you to have a sweet tooth if they're using high fructose corn syrup in any of their products. And um, unfortunately, <laughs> you'll see that it's in more products than not. And it's interesting to note, too, about that, because remember, you know, our body doesn't use fructose as fuel. It uses glucose. So if we're eating lots and lots of high fructose foods, you know, our body doesn't use that, you know, easily as fuel. And so that's why a lot of people get fat off of highly sugarized 
um, stuff because our body doesn't use that sugar. Um, it can, you know, in a kind of emergency when, when we don't have any glucose, um, you know, left over, we have very little, our body can turn the fructose into glucose by rearranging the, um, you know, uh, bonds in the, in the macromol or the, in the molecule, but okay. It's not the body's first choice. So it'll, it'll store it as fat first. Um, and then when it runs out of glucose, it'll go and get it. But that's uh, one of the reasons why, um, you know, high sugar stuff will make you fat. Now, the most complicated type of carbohydrate is what we call a polysaccharide. So if a monosaccharide was a single sugar unit and a disaccharide is two uh, single sugar units put together, a polysaccharide is long chains of sugar units. So there's three main types of polysaccharides. Um, the simplest is starch, which is you know lots of glucose molecules joined together in just a very long chain. So we see here, um, this is an example of starch. So it's just a bunch of, again, glucose molecules in a very, very, very long chain. Um, you know, starch is you know, basically what you know, potatoes and all that stuff are made of. In fact, most polysaccharides are going to be found in um, in plants. Okay, it's what you know plants basically build themselves out of are are polysaccharides. Now, um, another type of polysaccharide is glycogen, and again, glycogen is made up of glucose molecules. Because um, remember, you know, well, well, or either we'll get there when we talk about photosynthesis. But plants only make the sugar glucose. So whatever you know, polysaccharides plants are making out of it, it's always going to be glucose monomer. So a glycogen is made of uh, glucose molecules that are more branched than the starch. So here we can see that we've got you know a chain, and then it kind of branches off in here, and then here's another chain, and then there's a branch, and then you know here's this chain that keeps going, but there's branches coming off of it. Um, so that's, you know, a little slightly more complicated, and we call that glycogen. Now, glycogen is um, a polysaccharide that our body actually makes, um, in, you know, for muscle tissues um, and other types of tissues in our body. And the last type of polysaccharide is what we call cellulose, um, which I'm sure you probably heard of, because it's the most abundant organic compound on Earth. Um, it's what plants are basically made of. So they make starch, they can make starch, um, but most of their structure is what we call cellulose. Um, so they're long, long streams of glucose all linked together, um, but they're, you know, very branched. It's kind of like, it's very different manner than um, starch and glycogen. It's much, much more complicated. So this is kind of cellulose. In fact, it's so complicated that our bodies um, don't have the enzymes to actually break them down um, easily at all. So uh, if we eat lots of, you know, plant tissue, like, you know, um, the lettuce and all that stuff, um, it's, you know, you kind of think about it as a you know, cleansing or whatever because our bodies don't break down cellulose. It just goes right through and it kind of cleans out our intestines. So that's one of the reasons why it's, you know, kind of important to um, you know, include vegetables and lettuce and stuff like that in your diet, so that you know, we once in a while you can you know clean out all the little crevices and stuff like that of your intestines. So um, that polysaccharide again is called cellulose. All right, so we're going to move on to the second class of macromolecules called lipids and or fatty acids. Now these type of macromolecules are unique in that they are hydrophobic. So water, which is so important for life, um, is actually not liked by lipids or fatty acids. They are water avoiding. So um, this can make you know slightly complicated for our bodies to be able to um, use, but our bodies have a you know particular way of kind of getting around that. So there's um, Two, or there's many diverse classes of lipids and fatty acids, but there's two most important ones that we're going to talk about in this lecture are called fats and steroids. So fats are also called triglycerides, and um, 
this is an example here, oh, here, <laughs> of a triglyceride. Basically, tri means that there are one, two, three fatty acids, okay, or long chains of uh, lipid molecules attached to what's called a glycerol group, okay? So a glycerol group is a uh, three-carbon chain, uh, sugar kind of basically, and it is, you know, they're connected together by a dehydration synthesis. So these three fatty acids are um, dehydrated to one of, you know, each of the three carbons in the glycerol substance. So this is in essence what we call a fat molecule. So if you take a look at a fatty acid chain, if you take a deeper look at it, it's CH2, 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 CH2. It's a huge, long, we call it, remember, we call that hydrocarbon because it's made out of only carbons and hydrogens. And um, if you recall general chemistry, uh, the carbon and hydrogen bond is a nonpolar bond. That means they share their electrons equally so that nobody has you know, electrons more than the other. So if it's nonpolar, that's why it is hydrophobic. Okay, it's not going to be attracted to a water molecule because it's not going to have any you know, uh, electrons you know, trying to attract any other uh, kind of water molecule or anything. Those electrons are nicely shared between the carbon and the hydrogens. Now, um, fatty acid chains um, can be used as fuel. Like we said, the hydrocarbons are used for fuel. So our bodies can use fatty acids um, for fuel if there's no glucose around. Um, glucose is our bodies and our cells' primary source of fuel, but if we're running low, we can use um, fatty acids and other, uh, you know, fructose and other stuff as well. Now, we can get a variety of different types of fats or triglycerides um, because the long hydrocarbon chain can either have single bonds like we see you know, in these ones here. These are all single bonded hydrogen and carbons, okay, all of these guys, or um, there can exist double bonds as well. So if we see here, this is a double bond between two carbons, and that kind of puts a little kink in the, the chain. Okay, so we can get different structures as well. Now, it's interesting to note that if we do have double bonds in our fatty acids, um, they're what we call unsaturated. So a saturated fat is going to be one where each carbon that's connected to each other is going to have as many hydrogens as possible. Okay, so there's going to be no double bonds because they're all going to be single bonded to a hydrogen. So that's what we call a saturated fat. Okay, so if you look on the back of packages like food labels, it'll list saturated fats, how many grams of those, and then it'll, un it'll list usually, um, you know, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. Okay, so unsaturated ones means that there are double bonds so we've lost some hydrogen. So there's not as many hydrogens as what you know, technically can be um, fitting in that molecule. And um, unsaturated or, or lots and lots of different um, uh, double bonds within the chain make the fats liquid at room temperature. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. So if, for example, oils, okay, if you have... Um, olive oil, canola oil, corn oil, those are unsaturated fatty acids because they're liquid at room temperature. Now, saturated fatty acids, okay, the ones that actually aren't so good for you, um, so saturated fatty acids are going to be solid at room temperature. So um, a lot of animal fats are saturated um, because we find those, you know, kind of lards, the Crisco, that kind of stuff, those are saturated fatty acids, um, and so they are going to be solid at room temperature. And then again, once again, those saturated fatty acids have no double bonds. So they are just straight chain, as many hydrogens as we can fill up in those um, fatty acid molecules.
So the other type of fatty acid or lipid that we're going to talk about are steroids. And again, steroids are going to be hydrophobic, so they are classified as lipids. But they're structurally different if you take a look. Uh, remember, the fatty acids were you know, basically just kind of long chains of carbons and hydrogens. Steroids are um, based after the cholesterol unit, which is um, four rings of, you know, this carbon skeleton rings of uh, carbons and hydrogens. So if we have these in a ring form, it's um, what we call steroids. Now, the different types of steroids are going to be based off this cholesterol kind of format with the same kind of four rings here, except we're going to have different functional groups attached to the ends. So if we take a look here, um, testosterone has those four rings, but instead of the OH group that we have in cholesterol, it's going to have a carbonyl group um, on you know, the lower left-hand side. And instead of this huge hydrocarbon chain here that's kind of hanging off um, the upper side, testosterone has a hydroxyl group. So we can get many, many, many different types of steroids depending on what kind of functional groups we have attached to this four-ring um, four carbon skeleton. Again, you know, here's estrogen, okay, which, you know, remember testosterone is, you know, the male, basically, uh, hormone that, that um, is predominant in males. Estrogen is, you know, the female, we think of it as the female uh, hormone, okay, um, you know, although, you know, guys can have, guys do have some estrogen in them, girls do have some testosterone in them. But we can take a look and see that they are um, kind of basically similar in structure. They've got the same four rings put together. Again, the only thing that's different is um, where those uh, different functional groups are. So in estrogen, take a look at this, the hydroxyl group is on the bottom of the four rings and the carbonyl group is on the top. So there's not that much difference between testosterone and estrogen structurally, but it makes a huge, huge difference in development and um, you know, having the difference between being you know, female versus male. Now, steroids are used um, very widely in um, cells and in uh, different functions of the body. So we talked about them being used as hormones or cell signals um, that travel around the body and tell the diff different cells what to do. Um, steroids are also found in cell membranes, okay, along with the phospholipids. So we'll study that um, in a couple of lectures. But steroids are also there as well, um, giving it structure and also helping with cell signaling. Now, I imagine that um, when I talked about steroids at first, you probably were thinking of something like this picture. Um, this is a type of steroid. It's called an anabolic steroid, and it is a steroid molecule that is related to testosterone. So it looks similar to testosterone. It kind of acts similarly to, to testosterone, uh, but is not naturally made in your body. Um, anabolic steroids obviously are going to be responsible for helping your muscles build lots of mass. That's why bodybuilders and stuff like that, um, you know, may use steroids. But because it's not naturally made in your body, um, and it's you know kind of a man-made type of thing, um, it can cause serious physical and mental problems since it's you know not natural for your body to have it in you know its system. So we we get you know all kinds of side effects from these anabolic steroids. All right, let's take a look at our third macromolecule, which are proteins. Proteins are really cool because they are polymers, so they're you know really complex molecules. But every protein, okay, um, is made up of a combination of twenty different amino acids. So even though we can have up to, you know, in the human body, there's 30,000 different proteins in, in the human body, but each of those proteins is made up of a different combination of just 20 amino acids. So the building blocks of proteins are amino acids, and there's only 20 different kinds. 
So they, you know, there could be hundreds of thousands of different kinds of proteins in you know, the biological world, but all of them are just made up of 20 different amino acids. So that's, that's kind of cool. Now, um, each protein has a three-dimensional structure that's going to be corresponding to its specific function. So, um, you know, like I said, only 20 different amino acids, but the arrangement of those amino acids, how many of them, and the structure, the 3D structure that they have, are going to give proteins their different um, functions. There's four main types of proteins that exist in the biological world. We can have proteins that are made for structure. Okay, so for example, in, in us, hair, okay, is um, a protein. Um, there can be storage proteins, okay, that store energy like seeds and eggs. There are contractile proteins that are um, responsible for movement of different organisms. So in our muscles, we have contractile proteins. And then we've got transport proteins that are going to transport nutrients and other stuff um, throughout the organism. So for example, our blood is made up of um, transport proteins. Now in um, some organisms, there's also what we call defense proteins, okay, defensive proteins. Um, and those, like in our bodies, are called antibodies. They help protect um, our bodies from invasions of from other uh, organisms that would be harmful to us. And we've also got signal proteins as well that um, help in cell communication. Communi cells communicating uh, between each other will will communicate via signal proteins. So there's a whole variety of different kinds of proteins and different functions of proteins that we have in the biological world. Like I had mentioned before, proteins are made up of amino acids. So the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. And remember, there's only 20 different kinds. So if we put these amino acids together via dehydration synthesis, right? So we take out a water molecule between the two and um, they're going to stick together. Now, if we're talking particular dehydration sy synthesis between amino acids, it's what we call a peptide bond, okay, forming between two amino acids. Now, although there are 20 different amino acids, they basically have kind of the same structure within them. So if we take a look over here at this uh, picture, we can see that there's a central carbon inside of amino acid. And um, each, every amino acid is going to have what's called a carboxyl group or a carboxylic acid group. And on one side, okay, attached to one carbon or one side of the carbon, it's always going to have just a hydrogen on another side of the central carbon. And then on the third side of the central carbon is an amino group. So we have a nitrogen attached to two, uh, two hydrogens there. And what makes each amino acid different is this side group. So this side group is the variable. That's what makes each amino acid different. So every amino acid, like I said, has these um, three things, the hydrogen, the carbon carboxyl group, and the amino group. And then what makes them different from each other is the variable side group. So if we take a look down here at the bottom, um, these are two different amino acids, serine and leucine, and you can see that their side groups are very different from each other. Now, be thankful that you're non-majors because um, biological majors would have to memorize the side groups of all 20 amino acids. I remember doing that, and that was not very fun. Plus, we had to memorize all the different um, kinds of monosaccharides, you know, where all the different hydroxyl patterns and carbonyl groups and stuff were so be thankful you're non-majors because you don't have to memorize that but you do need to know kind of the basic structure of amino acids and um, why each of them are different from each other all right so proteins are big macromolecules um, they usually consist of a hundred or more amino acids that form what we call a polypeptide chain okay and so that term is unique to proteins. 
Um, that polypeptide word comes from the peptide bond that forms between two amino acids um, when we take out that water. Okay, When we have a dehydration synthesis between two different amino acids, we call that a peptide bond. And a whole bunch of amino acids strung together is what we call a polypeptide chain. So if we have a protein that's just a kind of a straight line of chain of um, amino acids, um, that's what we're going to call our primary structure, is basically kind of the chain of a backbone, basically, of proteins that we have. Um, and then we can have different 3D structures as well. So we're going to take a look at that. So here again, talking about the primary structure of a protein is basically just kind of that backbone, that um, single chain of amino acids kind of making up that protein is what we call the primary structure of a protein. Okay, so it is um, important to kind of point out that a polypeptide chain of amino acids is not exactly the same as a fully functional protein. Because we can make polypeptide <clears throat> chains in a lab, but they might not be actual functional proteins. So it's like saying, you know, I've got a long strand of yarn, but it's not making a sweater yet. It's just a long strand of yarn. Okay. So in order for a protein to actually be functional, that polypeptide chain needs to be twisted and coiled and folded into unique shapes that will actually do some work, okay, or, or um, provide structure or will actually, um, you know, be, you know, like an enzyme or something like that in a biological <clears throat> species. So for a protein to be fully functional, we're going to have at least three levels of st structure within the protein, that primary um, polypeptide chain structure and we're going to have um, what's called secondary and tertiary structures as well. And then if proteins are very complex and they've got more than one polypeptide um, chain in them, we can actually have a fourth level called a quaternary level of um, structure. So again, proteins, even though there's only 20 amino acids that actually make them up, we can get hugely complicated in size and structure and function. So let's talk about secondary and tertiary structure. Um, remember, primary structure is basically just you know the arrangement of amino acids in a chain, that polypeptide chain. Okay, once we kind of fold that polypeptide chain into what's called you know like here's what we call um, a beta beta pleated sheet. Okay, it's kind of like a folded paper, accordion style. If um, our polypeptide chain kind of gets folded like that. That's what we call kind of a secondary structure. Or instead of being folded like a pleated sheet, um, it could be wrapped around like a spiral staircase. Okay, so this is what we call secondary structure. And then it can get more complicated than that with its tertiary structure. So here is a picture of the tertiary structure. So we take all the pleated parts and the spirally parts of this big long chain and we fold that even more together. So it's kind of like this big old blob of you can see that there are, you know, spirally parts and pleated parts and they're all kind of, you know, twisted together. So that's what we call the tertiary structure of a protein. So again, once again, primary structure is just, you know, the amino acid sequence in the big long chain. Um, once those kind of fold together as either like the pleated sheets or the spirals, that's what we call the secondary structure. And then all of those sheets and spirals all folded and kind of twisted together is our tertiary structure. So proteins can be very complicated. Okay, so last but not least, in terms of 3D um, protein structure, we've got the quaternary structure. Okay, so if we have more than one of these polypeptide chains that are all twisted and folded together and it's um, weakly bonded to another one, that's what we call our quaternary structure. So if we can see here, this is kind of like, this is a tertiary structure of one um, polypeptide. So this is kind of the same thing as like right here. And if we took a, you know, another 
polypeptide chain that's been twisted and turned like that, and we've um, kind of attached it to each the other guy. Okay, that's what we call a quaternary structure. So it's um, more than one polypeptide chain that's bonded to each other to make a huge protein. And so that's going to give us its you know overall 3D structure because they can be um, you know attached in many different um, shapes and structures. In fact, you know, hemoglobin is a huge protein in our blood that, you know, has four different polypeptide chains that are all kind of kinked together. And it's kind of, it kind of, oh, just kidding. It kind of has um, this, you know, flowery kind of shape. There's four of these, you know, um, polypeptide chains together that all kind of go around um, this heme group, which is made of iron. Okay, and so this whole thing is the uh, hemoglobin protein, and so you can see that it's um, it, and within all of these um, quaternary structures, you know, there's the tertiary and the you know whatever. It's all kind of folded, so it's it's super hugely complicated, um, and it but it's got you know incredible function of you know uh, taking oxygen to our blood and bringing back carbon dioxide and stuff like that. So it's a cool protein, but very complicated. So even though protein is um, a hugely complicated structural macromolecule, it's actually very sensitive to cellular environments. So if we have a change in pH in a cell or a change in temperature of cells, um, change in ionic composition of cells, all of these factors can actually unfold and loosen up the 3D structure of a protein and cause denaturation, okay, which is a bad thing because if proteins have been denatured, then that means they're not functional, right? If anything, any part is loose or unfolded, the protein will not function the way it's supposed to. And so um, if, you know, if it gets unfolded a little bit and then, you know, the, the temperature changes back to normal, um, that kind of stuff can be reversible. But if it's too drastic of unfolding, um, then it could be irreversible and very dangerous to the, you know, the living system. All right, so we are almost done. We're going to take a look at our fourth and final macromolecule and the molecules of life. Um, and those are nucleic acids. And these molecules are super cool because they can actually store information. Um, so we're talking about, you know, DNA and RNA molecules that store information about how to make proteins. So in order to make proteins in, you know, the highly structured and complicated functions and stuff that they are, we need nucleic acids in order to do that. So um, like I said, there's two types of nucleic acids. There's DNA and there's RNA. DNA is our genetic makeup material, and RNA is kind of a helper that helps translate the DNA into proteins. Um, but both of them are polymers of what we call nucleotides, or nucleic acids. So these nucleotides are made up of three parts. All right, so we have a five-carbon sugar. Okay, so depending on whether it's DNA or RNA, the sugar is slightly different. Um, in DNA, we call that deoxyribose, and in RNA, it's just ribose. So just kind of structurally the difference, we have a sugar called ribose that's in RNA, but the deoxyribose means it's missing an oxygen in DNA. So that's why it's called deoxyribose. Um, all right, so the other part, is a negatively charged phosphate group. Okay, so we've got a phosphate group with extra electrons that is going to make it negatively charged. And we've also, on um, the third little branch here, we've got either it's going to be a one ring sugar, or I'm sorry, one ring nitrogen base or a two ring nitrogen base, just depending um, upon the type. And remember, we've got four different. Um, nitrogen bases. Two of them are one ring, two of them are two rings, um, and that's adenine, guanosine, cytosine, and thiamine. And so we're going to take a look at um, those structures as well. So the relatively simple part of the nucleotides is the sugar and the phosphate groups, because they're the same no matter what nucleotides you're talking about. 
The thing that differs between nucleotides is the nitrogenous, nitrogenous bases. Okay, so in DNA, we have um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. Or, you know, when we're talking about genetics and stuff, we'll just abbreviate them as A, G, C, and T. So those are the ones that are found in DNA. RNA is just one difference that we will talk about in a couple of slides. So when we put these long chains of nucleotides together, we get what's called polynucleotides. Now the backbone, in essence, of these um, macromolecules is the sugar phosphate kind of groups. Those are all linked together in um, the nucleotides. So the sugar and the phosphates of two different nucleotides are um, linked together through a dehydration synthesis to make this backbone here. Okay, and then what we get sticking out of it are those little nitrogen bases. So the nitrogen bases get to stick out kind of from the from that backbone. Now DNA is is um, twisted in what we call a double helix. Okay, it's a double stranded molecule. It's twisted into a double helix like this. Okay, I'm sure you recognize from uh, high school biology. And um, it gets you know it has that unique feature there. So we've got um, the the double strand, the double stranded backbone of DNA, which is the sugar and phosphate, and then in the middle there, again, we've got those um, nitrogen bases that are going to be um, attracted to each other. Okay. Now RNA, which is um, a nucleotide just like DNA, is just slightly different in a few ways. So, like what I mentioned earlier. The sugar in RNA is slightly different. It's got an extra oxygen on it. Um, and there's one uh, nitrogen base that's different. So instead of having um, the thiamine, the T, in DNA, okay, RNA does not have thiamine. It uses uracil instead. So instead of T, you'd have U. All right, so that's um, another difference in RNA. And then... The final difference of RNA is that it's usually a single-stranded um, molecule. So, you know how DNA was double-stranded, kind of helix thing. Um, RNA is usually a single-stranded uh, molecule that uh, is used to help make proteins. All right, so we've come to the end of all of our macromolecules. So this is all the information that you guys are going to need to know about them. And then um, what we're going to do now is take a look at how these function in the cells.